All right, today's lecture we're going to talk about lasers, and in a separate lecture we'll talk about uh, diathermy or shortwave diathermy. And uh, you can read through the objectives in your slides. Uh, we're going to be talking about electromagnetic radiation, and you need to know the physiological effects of that type of radiation, you know, how to apply it, and the same sort of things we've been doing, indications, contraindications for the application of this type of energy to our patients. All right, so two types of modalities that are going to be using this type of um, uh, radiation that we'll be talking about, and that's going to be really laser and diathermy. Ultraviolet radiation was used in the past, uh, so you'll see some kind of, I would almost say, more historical references to it. You might even run into an ultraviolet machine in a clinic somewhere. I've never seen one used, uh, so doubtful you'll run across one either, but uh, you'll see it in your uh, textbooks um, as well. But we're going to go through the following things, physical properties, physiological effects, clinical application, contraindications, and how to assess effectiveness. All right, so when we start talking about electromagnetic radiation, uh, you know, so far in this course we've looked at uh, just electricity. And here we're going to be basically be combining uh, electric, electricity and a magnetic field. And... Uh, these two fields are oriented perpendicular to each other, as you can see in the uh, diagrams, and you get a resultant electromagnetic field. And the thing with electromagnetic field is you don't need a medium. We don't need air. We don't need the gel coupling, things like that. Okay, so, and examples of that, um, you know, things that we use at home, microwave oven. Okay, that's electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation of uh, the... Uh, uh, sun tanning beds, things like that. Okay, so ultraviolet light. Um, and then the things that we use in our clinics. Okay, also um, uh, uh, like uh, diathermy and laser. When we start talking about electromagnetic energy, it's categorized by its frequency and its wavelength. We've looked at frequency and wavelength quite a bit in this course, so hopefully you're a little bit uh, familiar with it now. Uh, but wavelength is just defined as the distance between two successive peaks. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, and there's a little lambda uh, 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 symbol right there for wavelength. And when it's far apart, it's a long wa wavelength. When it's closer together, it's a short wavelength. Okay, um, we could also talk about that as an increase in frequency. Okay, so shorter wavelength has to go ha has to do with an increase in frequency as well. So, you know, if we look at this waveform that's here on the screen, you can see as it moves towards the right, that's a higher frequency, and that's also a decrease in the wavelength. Okay? So, okay, so wavelength, as wavelength increases, frequency starts to decrease. Okay? All right, so this just gives an, uh, an, uh, an overall idea of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from uh, ELF or ELF over there, extra low frequency uh, waves. Uh, those those are typically used for communicating with submarines while they're at sea. We have some very, very large antennas that are buried in the ground up in places like Montana, and they use those for penetrating through the ocean water. It's kind of a little aside there. Um, but then you can see that we've got um, uh, uh, radio waves in the next spectrum over from 3 kilohertz up to about 300 megahertz. Our microwave frequency, our infrared frequency, our visible light, um, ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays as we come across. Okay, so uh, uh, and obviously the things that we're going to be using in our clinic are not out in this spectrum. That's ionizing radiation. That's going to be you know damaging uh, to tissues and or possibly possibly to be damaging depending on the uh, level of exposure. Uh, and we're going to be down. Uh, more in this frequency range right in here, okay, and for our, our wavelengths and for our uh, frequencies. All right, so we'll talk a minute about that. Hey, Pop. Hey, Scotty. How you been, sport? Whoa! I got you a present. Really? Open the tank. Open the tank! Are those sharks with laser beams attached to their heads? Cool. You mean I... All right, so 
that's what a laser is, is what we've seen there. Um, and so uh, uh, moving on from that, uh, from a historical, historical perspective, um, uh, the th type of uh, electromagnetic energy that's been used is uh, sun bass, infrared, UV lamps, like I like talked about. And then one day uh, someone came up with a thing called lasers, and laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So obviously that's why we had to come up with a neat, cool term for it, because that's uh, kind of quite a, a mouthful. But the principles of laser light were defined by Einstein way back in the early 1900s, and the first device was created in the 60s. And we're mainly going to be talking about low-power uh, lasers, or what are called biostimulation or low-level laser therapy. You'll see it, LLLT. And those are kind of the, the terms that are now being recommended for what's called photobiomodulation. Uh, so, you know, photo being light and biology, as in biology, or bio, bi as in biology. Okay, modulation changing. And so uh, things that we're changing with light is basically what that's uh, saying right there. Okay, so in this, uh, basically from the 60s to the 80s, um, uh, there were some benefits uh, published for uh, using lasers for soft tissue healing. And kind of the way this came about uh, was uh, uh, some, of the, some of the original researchers in this area, Mester in particular here, uh, they were doing uh, cancer research and they were implanting cells, cancer cells into animals and they were using uh, a, a high-energy laser or a cauterizing laser in order to cut tissue in order to insert the cells. And uh, someone noticed that the, one, the animals that were cut with the laser device uh, healed much quicker than the ones who were cut with a scalpel. And so, as in some of our best discoveries, we kind of stumble into things and somebody realized that there was some effect going on in the tissues when they were using the laser and so, uh, you know, launched off on a whole other uh, realm of, of research, okay? And so, uh, uh, the benefits have been shown for, for uh, many, many years, uh, but the use is much more frequent uh, in European countries, Canada on, and Australia, and really s still uh, coming into the market here in the United States. I mean, they've been around now for, for several years, and, and many clinics are using uh, light therapy. Uh, but still not as widespread as elsewhere. But about 2002 is when we had our first approval for using uh, a laser in United States clinics for, for pain. So how do these things work? Okay, if we go back and look at, uh, at you know, what we think an atom looks like with our, our nucleus and with our all the various orbits, uh, what happens when uh, an atom absorbs energy? So when energy is put into this system, some of those electrons uh, uh, move or jump uh, the, to a different, to a higher uh, orbit, okay? If you remember some of this from probably your high school physics, all right? And so as that energy, though, is released and the uh, electron returns to its original or normal level, it gives off some energy. And those, those, that energy that it gives off is known as photons as those electrons return to a normal level. Okay, so a real simple example of this is, uh, you know, if you have a, a heater in your bathroom, let's say, you know, something that shows the red coils. So you put electricity, you know, you go to turn your heater on, and you put electricity through that thing, and those red coils heat up. This would be the same thing, say, for a toaster. Okay, so we have uh, that energy heating up uh, the, the metal, and it's glowing red. Okay, so that's because of the uh, increase in the energy. Uh, uh, and actually, what you're seeing is, is the photons as some of those electrons are returning back to their other level. Okay, so it's the glowing red that you see uh, when we do that. Okay, so we're using that same kind of principle then in order to produce this special kind of light. And what we're doing then is using a, a special uh, uh, medium, and we'll talk about different ones here in a minute, but different types of, there are different types of lasers. But we're basically pumping energy into that, excite some, exciting some electrons, and then as those electrons uh, return to the original uh, energy level, uh, we, get, uh, we get photons of light being emitted, as shown in the diagram right here. Okay, so the neat thing about this then is that we get a very special kind of light. We get light that has these three properties right here. These are very important for you to know. Hint, hint. Okay, so the, the three, three things that 
um, that, that light has is it's monochromatic. In other words, it's only one color. It's coherent. All the waves are in phase, kind of shown in the little cartoon diagram over here, that they're all, uh, 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 this, if we say they're, they're linear here, that might be a, a easier term to, see, to, to show, but they're all in phase. Um, and they're directional. And so as shown in the bottom diagram, instead of uh, like what a regular flashlight would look like with just a, a widespread beam, we get a laser beam, just like a laser pointer that we would use here in the classroom, is that uh, you have minimal divergence of that um, uh, light wave. And so it's very uh, directionally oriented. Okay, so those are three, uh, three important properties to keep in mind as we go along. Okay, so we can measure that uh, the, the power of a laser um, by both the energy density or the power density. Now, notice that the energy density is power times time over the area. So that's going to be the size of the, the laser head, just as we looked at with uh, ultrasound. And the power density, the only difference there is that it doesn't have the time feature built into it. And as we'll see, most of our machines are going to be using energy density um, on their display and giving us joules per square centimeter, which is a dosage because we're giving um, the power and the time all in one thing. So common types of lasers that you might see in the clinic are helium neon, uh, galenium arsenide. Okay, so uh, and, and those give us different types of, of wavelength. So the uh, helium neon is about 600, or as it shows here, 632.8 uh, nanometers. That's the NM. Okay, the gallium arsenide uh, uh, can be 600 to 1200 nanometers. And since that is just about invisible uh, for most of that spectrum, usually they take a, an LED bulb and put it in there so you can at least see uh, where that light is going. And so it's just, uh, you know, the, the laser light itself is invisible, but the LED light we can see. Okay. So most of the lasers that we're seeing in the clinic, and this was just this just changed a few years ago, that now they're less than 1,000 milliwatts. You'll still see a lot that are 500 because that was what the rule was in previous years. One of our machines is a 500 milliwatt machine, but uh, uh, so now that that rule's been changed, or you know, it's been increased, so you can have a thousand milliwatt uh, uh, power, and that's fixed. That's something that we're not adjusting. We're not changing on the machine. That's just is what it is. Okay, that's the the power setting, and uh, uh, have they they're limited to a, a maximum uh, power density of 50 milliwatts per square centimeter. So even though the power of the laser itself is 1,000 by the time we divide by the, the uh, surface area, then uh, uh, you can you know, come up with this uh, power density or an energy density of 35 joules per square centimeter, and that's taking in the amount of time that it's allowed to be on. Okay? So FDA approved this thing for uh, uh, using it for pain, uh, but obviously once it's in our clinics, uh, people are using it for just about everything. You know, there's no laser police looking over anyone's shoulder as to what they're using it for. So people um, are applying it for all kinds of different uh, problems. So uh, m uh, the wavelengths that we're using in the clinic are between 600 and 1300 nanometers. And those are uh, uh, being used because that's what optimally penetrates our skin. Um, and so you'll see that most of the devices now also, they, they kind of uh, give you a broad spectrum, and so they give you multiple different types of uh, lasers involved in one head. So you're getting uh, uh, both, both uh, short and longer wavelengths of light all at the same time, more of a shotgun approach rather than just a, a bullet. Okay, so this brings up a whole other topic then is that now, in the past several years, we're starting to see more and more LED uh, lights or light-emitting diodes. Okay, so uh, uh, since those have um, really taken off and gotten much, much cheaper, uh, somebody had the nice idea or bright idea that, you know, once we put laser through the skin, it breaks up and is not coherent anyway. So why do we have to use laser? Why can't we just get a, uh, a, a close approximation of, a, of the uh, wavelength, and because that's what we consider is the key ingredient here is the wavelength of the light. Why don't we get something like an LED that's close to it? You can see on the bottom diagram, you know, our laser is 632.8 nanometers. That's the wavelength of that particular laser dependent on the lasing medium. But an LED, we can get close. 
but we kind of get that bell-shaped curve of, uh, of, of a broad spectrum. So shown here in the diagram from your text of 550 to 700 for that uh, uh, 630, so for that 630 nanometer spread. So, um, so now we're seeing LED light devices in our clinics as well, and that's what we're going to be using in our lab. Uh, we, we did have a Chattanooga laser head, um, but it was uh, damaged last year, and we have not replaced it yet. So hopefully we'll get that back sometime in the near future. But we do have the LED lights. Okay, so the deal about LED is that it's cheaper. Okay, so you can buy a machine like this um, much, much, uh, you know, with a lot, lot less cost. And the claims are that the LEDs have the same, at the same wavelengths, have the same effects as laser. Now, uh, uh, I think the, the jury is still out, and the research still has to prove that uh, definitively. But that's uh, you know what a lot of the manufacturers are going with, and so you'll see in your clinics you're going to see a combination of both um, LED and laser uh, devices, and you'll also see the SLD or the super luminous diode uh, collections as well, and that's actually what we have in our in our heads out here are the SLDs. <coughs> All right, so this just explains a little bit more about the. Uh, you know what we're seeing on our our machine screens okay so don't let all the the, the math and physics here uh, scare you a little bit but when we just talk about power uh, power is just the rate at which energy is being produced and so on our machines we have a fixed power of a thousand milliwatts right so we can look at that um, energy uh, on, on a unit time sort of basis um, and we can also um, uh, look at at power. Okay, so um, uh, let me back up here a second. But energy uh, per unit time is a joules per second, and that is a watt. Okay, so uh, so then if we flip flop that and we look at what energy is, it's a watt times time, right? So uh, uh, just taking that joules and and uh, uh, multiplying both sides by the seconds, we get watt times time. Okay. So um, when we want to try and calculate a dosage then, what we need is that milliwatts um, uh, per second multiplied times the time, as you can see in the first uh, calculation there, showing uh, uh, you know, the average power times time at 15 milliwatts. And we can look at this in a couple different ways as a power density or an energy density. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the, the bottom line is what is shown on your screen is the, in the last bullet there is the energy density. So when we dial this up, we're going to be putting in joules per square centimeter. And so what you'll do is look up on a table or in a, in a book, um, uh, what is the recommended dosage for this particular uh, condition, condition? And so you may find that it's six joules per square centimeter. And so what you're getting then is time built into that. So the machine will automatically set up a time for you, kind of like our IONTO machine. So this is real nice. After you go through the gyrations of understanding the, uh, the calculations that go into it above, really what you need to know is I just need to look up and see what's the recommended uh, energy density for the treatment that I want to give. I dial that into my machine. It sets everything else up for me, okay, based on the power of the machine, based on the time to give me the right joules per square centimeter. So, a lot said, but this is the kind of the easiest thing um, uh, about the machines is you just look up your joules per square centimeter and um, you're ready to go. Okay, so what does this stuff do? That's one of the, that's kind of the million dollar question yet. Okay, so the biggest thing that's been shown uh, uh, definitively in our labs is that it promotes ATP production. Okay, so if we're able to produce uh, uh, you know, more ATP, um, we're, you know, basically, uh, for lack of a better term here, lighting things up, right? So, so we're able to, laser and LED have been shown to improve ATP production by as much as uh, 70%. A lot of secondary effects that are claimed, uh, research isn't quite as good as showing these things, but uh, uh, promoting collagen production, uh, modulating inflammation, inhibit bacterial growth, promote vasodilation. And as you can imagine, if we're increasing all this energy that's available for the cells, all those other things can possibly fall into line. So, uh, you know, the, the baseline thing to remember is that we're probably uh, affecting our ATP production 
but more on this, you know, in future years as as uh, researchers kind of uh, hone in on how this is working. So the treatment considerations you have then are the power, the wavelength, and the treatment time. Now the nice thing is is the power is fixed by the machine. You can't change that. The wavelength that's fixed in the heads that you have, uh, unless you have multiple heads, you don't change that. And the treatment time is really based on the power. Uh, and so all you're going to do is, like I said, look up in a table what's the recommended uh, setting for the condition. You dial that into your machine, and it figures everything else out for you. So so that makes things nice. Okay, so just remember that whatever the power that we have is going to going to determine the treatment time. A great example of this is that we do have one 500 milliwatt machine and one 1000 milliwatt and the other two are, uh, are 1000 milliwatt machines in the Solaris units that we have. And so you might be working on one uh, machine and dial in six joules per square centimeter and the treatment takes 30 seconds and you may grab another machine on a different day and dial six joules and it takes 60 seconds and so all you've done is changed machines from your 1000 milliwatt machine down to your 500 milliwatt machine and so in order to get the same dosage it takes double the amount of time okay and we'll demonstrate that in lab so that's a little bit clearer so looking across a few devices then uh, we have the Chattanooga machine which is about a, the 1000 milliwatt machine the Solaris which we have like I said both the 500 and the 1000 uh, You'll see in various clinics some of these other machines. Anodyne therapy is, is popular now, but anodyne is just, again, light therapy. And that's on a very, very low uh, 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 power level. And uh, so you'll find those treatments are more like 30 minutes, you know, 45 minutes that they're taking those if you're in a clinic where they're using uh, anodyne type therapy. So, uh, but the, the, the dosage is going to be the same as what we're giving for other treatments. So it's just on longer. So just remember that the lower the power, the longer the treatment time has got to be to get to a particular dosage. And this is a picture of what one of the heads looks like for our Dynatronics uh, unit. And uh, it has 32 infrared diodes and uh, four red diodes. And you can see they've kind of hit the spectrum of their wavelengths, having both 660 and 880 uh, nanometers. You have the ability to change the uh, duty cycle so you can have it continuous and you can use it pulsed uh, the power output is one watt except for on one of our machines which is 500 and uh, the dosage as we can see right there is uh, uh, for, for a dosage of six joules per square centimeter we end up with a 30 second treatment as I stated previously all right so if our Chattanooga machine was working, this is what the sound head would look like that you'd be using for that. And uh, uh, that is a laser, but again, it gives us a, a broad spectrum of lasers right there, giving us uh, five, uh, two, five 850 nanometer uh, uh, heads, uh, lights, and four 670 nanometers. Uh, so we have a 200 milliwatt laser and a 10 milliwatt LEDs all in one head. Okay, so for total output power of 1,040 milliwatts. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what some other devices might look like. All right, so uh, again, this is just a chart showing you the different spot sizes and how the average power density is going to change. So you can just take a look at that. Um, and this is from one of the manufacturers. So of course, Solaris is in bold and uh, all capital because you know, they claim that they have the the best power and everything. So uh, wavelength is going to determine our depth of penetration. And this is kind of very similar to when we were looking at depth of penetration with our uh, ultrasound, is that when we have a, uh, a higher frequency, okay, which would be the, if we look at the uh, uh, 660 nanometers, that's a short wavelength, high frequency. Okay, those two go together. You can see, uh, if we look at the diagram on the right, we don't get a whole lot of penetration. But when we go with the longer wavelength, 880 nanometer, uh, which is a uh, lower frequency, just as if we were talking about our 1 megahertz, it penetrates better. And again, that has to do with kind of the resonance frequency of our bodies. And uh, so, so we get deeper penetration 
with the longer wavelength uh, type uh, devices. Okay, and so by what we're talking about here is, you know, we get direct penetration of a helium neon uh, laser in about the two to five millimeters. Okay, a glenium arsenide, arsenide uh, one to two centimeters. And uh, you can see listed there too, we say we have indirect effects. And those are cells that may be in contact or close enough to be in contact with that increased AP, ATP production. And so you have some indirect effects happening you know, outside the area where the light has actually not even penetrated. Okay, so um, uh, just just realize that you know, and that's going to be true with anything that we're applying. You know, anything that's in adjacent to the energy that we're putting in is going to uh, have a possibility of having some effect on those tissues. Um, so this is cross section of what the Dynatronics uh, cluster probe looks like. Uh, remember, with this one, these are all LEDs. Uh, so we don't have any of the safety concerns that we do with laser light. We talk about safety here coming up in just a little bit. Um, and so uh, uh, just a comparison of uh, different devices. Um, the Solaris unit, of course, having a couple different wavelengths. This MedX device, a couple of different wavelengths. And the anodyne and the microlight and the Erconia device is only uh, covering one uh, part of the spectrum. So we don't really know uh, which is the best part. Uh, we're probably better off having the, the multi-spectrum devices that we have. Okay, so what do we use this for? So uh, tissue healing. So uh, looking at soft tissue uh, is something that uh, it's being used for because of the uh, thought that we're increasing collagen synthesis. So we've, we, uh, we, it's been shown uh, to increase the rate of healing, wound closure, tensile strength of the wound, okay, and a quicker healing time. Um, but here again, here we are in our PT world of research and the uh, quality of studies are somewhat questionable. And then we have this huge, broad, widespread band of power settings down here, our dosages, 5 to 24 joules per square centimeter. And you'll see that uh, across the board is that, um, you know, we're not going to def be defining a really precise uh, <coughs> uh, setting, dosage setting there. Uh, you'll see it just kind of anywhere from from uh, you know four up to about 20 for just about anything that we're going to do. Uh, so meta-analysis for arthritis has shown some benefit for short-term use for RA. Uh, conflicting results on the studies that have been done for uh, osteoarthritis and no specific parameters to recommend there. Okay, so for uh, uh, lymphedema, um, there have been a few studies looking at uh, looking at lymphedema with the following parameters. Uh, setting of about uh, one and a half joules per square centimeter three times a week. Okay, and so there's a little bit of evidence for lymphedema. Um, this is a picture of the type of pads that are used for um, the anodyne units, and those are, they're typically wrapped around. Uh, they're, they're being used for patients with uh, diabetic neuropathy with a lot of pain in their legs, and so they can take in these pads and, and wrap them around uh, uh, basically the entire leg. And, uh, and so these are usually put on uh, <coughs> in 90 milli, uh, milliwatts. Um, uh, I have 33 seconds there. I think that should be 30 minutes there So because these are very, very low, low um, output. And so usually this is a 20 to 30 minute uh, treatment. And so you might see those in some clinics. I think here uh, locally, uh, Rapid Rehab, I think, is using that uh, quite a bit. All right, so uh, studies seem to show overall positive effect on pain for numerous conditions, and that's what I think you're going to see it used uh, quite often in our clinics. Um, and the mechanisms for that pain relief are unknown. Okay, so documentation. Uh, obviously, you want to show where uh, you know uh, where you treated. Uh, big uh, important part here is what the dosage was, because even if you were to change machi machines and that had a different output. Uh, or type of light therapy, at least the dosage would stay the same, okay, in that joules per squared centimeter. Okay, so, um, uh, but, you know, once you start a treatment, I would highly recommend staying with one particular machine and not changing from a laser to an LED or, you know, just what happens to be available. I would keep that the same so you have some reproducibility in your results. So, about uh, recording the frequency and type of laser that you're using. And then, of course, the, the patient's response, so either, you know, pain scales, functional scales, uh, wound closure rates, things like that, that you can use uh, depending on what you're, you're treating. So contraindications, 
Um, uh, this is a pretty darn safe uh, modality, and as you can kind of see here, if you look at the contras, you know, it's basically over any, any place you don't want to be introducing some uh, type of energy, you know, over malignant tissue, over the eyes, uh, possibly where we're already susceptible to problems. So after, uh, you know, uh, cancer treatment, um, uh, any place where we're hemorrhaging, you know, where we don't want to increase uh, cell activity. Okay, uh, so, you know, kind of, I think, a little common sense there on, on where you're applying it. Um, and then uh, some precautions down below. Okay, uh, safety. Uh, until we until you start to use a regular laser, there really are no safety considerations. So our units, uh, there's nothing to really worry about as far as uh, you know eyes and wearing goggles or anything like that. Um, but once you, if uh, again, if our Chattanooga was up and running, you do have to wear goggles, and it's recommended that both the operation operator and the patient wear protective eyewear when you're when you're utilizing that. Okay, so that can be a problem. And then uh, class four lasers or high power lasers, uh, uh, those are typically used like in surgery and we uh, obviously aren't using those, okay? So the, the, the bottom line is, is the LEDs, perfectly safe, no eye uh, problems, no injury. Uh, you do need to be careful though if you get in a clinic where you're using a true laser. Okay, so very important that, you know, only the therapists um, or the trained people are using these. You should never let your patient just, uh, you know, pull, uh, you know, mess with the machines and use them. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if it's in an area or it's, if, if you're using uh, laser light, you definitely want to be uh, trying to control the area so you don't accidentally um, uh, beam someone who's not uh, uh, being treated, you know, or not wearing goggles. So, so uh, you know, having it, doing these in a in a protected area, either curtained or another um, office area, would be good. And anybody that's in the room should be wearing safety goggles. All right. So, um, uh, you know, how effective is it? Uh, again, you know, still, I think the jury's still out here. Um, uh, and uh, you know, FDA did uh, approve uh, us for using. Um, laser for carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, using an 830 nanometer laser and they found that they had complete resolution of findings in 70 percent of hands so that was pretty high um, and uh, using parameters that you see below in the systematic review uh, they found uh, uh, good effects for pain reduction for chronic knee pain tmj using on the zygopophyseal joints okay so so pain pain reduction seemed to be uh, pretty good with that uh, people have been using it for musculoskeletal conditions, uh, using eight to nine hundred nanometer uh, uh, type wavelengths. Uh, but again, the, the power settings all over the map, or the or the dosages you can see there, one to thirty six joules per square centimeter, um, and a uh, little bit lower over peripheral sensory nerves trigger points. Okay, RA, you're looking at uh, uh, dosage rates three point six to twenty five, so pretty long you know pretty wide spectrum right there again uh, tendonitis three to eight joules per square centimeters tendon repair 0.2 to four okay and acute inflammatory pain uh, about two and a half so um, you know kind of bottom line is is you know you want to try and find like we've been doing with our treatment rationales find where someone's utilized a particular uh, type of laser similar to what you end up having or light therapy and you know, finding some general parameters. The manufacturers put out books that have them in, but usually they're you know pretty wide spectrum. You know, giving you three to ten, three to eight. Um, so so your you know your setting levels here uh, are going to be quite variable until we get some uh, better guidance from our researchers. Okay, so uh, bottom line is a lot of things in our physical therapy modalities. We need more quality studies. Okay, so obviously problems in dosage like we just talked about. Um, there can be methods, uh, problems in the method of application. But as we'll see in lab, this one's pretty simple. Okay, there's not a whole lot of technique involved here, um, uh, and we just got to try and find the right kind of patients to be able to apply this to, um, and then decide what kind of laser or LED that we're going to use. Okay, so that's kind of laser in a nutshell, and uh, next we'll be talking about uh, shortwave diathermy. Okay, see you later.